Okay. Hello, everyone. I'm Jeff Angel from the Total Environment Center, and welcome to our webinar with Tony Chappell, CEO of the New South Wales EPA. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the Gadigal people, traditional owners of the land on which Total Environment Centre normally meets and pay my respects to elders past and present. I extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples here today. As we are gathering from different parts of Australia, TEC acknowledges the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. While TEC has defended these important environmental connections to communities since 1972, we acknowledge and show gratitude for the ongoing protection that traditional custodians have provided for tens of thousands of years. Today, we'll hear from Tony with a presentation for a bit less than 30 minutes. And then I'll ask questions which have been collated from your contributions. Due to limited time, we might not be able to get to all the questions in the chat, but we will send them onwards to the EPA. We will close at 2 p.m. Please note that your camera and microphone will remain off throughout the webinar. Uh, but that we are recording the webinar. <clears throat> a quick intro to Tony. He has had broad experience in the corporate energy regulation and policy fields, and most prominently, of Chief of Staff to Rob Stokes, Environment Minister in the previous New South Wales government. I first met him when I wanted to discuss our work and he showed me one of our campaign postcards for container refunds that was being sent to the minister. I like this, he said, and he worked with the minister in ensuing years to achieve the historic breakthrough with the introduction of cash for containers. He was supportive on many other issues, and I got to know him as a person with a good green heart and mind. So let's hear from Tony in his new role as EPA CEO. He's slightly under the weather, uh, but we hope we'll get, get through in the next hour. Over to you, Tony. Well, thanks very much, Jeff. Um, and hi, everyone. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be with you all today. Um, Jeff mentioned I'm just struggling with a uh, fairly mild form of, I think it's flu or some kind of cold, so I'm working from home. Uh, but if I'm not my usual exuberant self, that's why. But I'm, there's no way I was going to cancel this webinar. Um, I'll also just start by acknowledging uh, we're all meeting on Aboriginal land, uh, always was and always will be. And my, me personally, I'm on Gadigal land as well. So I want to thank uh, their elders for their ongoing custodianship, past, present and um, stretching out into the future. And just acknowledge the many lessons that traditional ecological knowledge holds for more effective restoration and protection of the natural values and systems that we all hold dear and depend upon for our own, um, frankly, our own lives and, and our future prosperity. <clears throat> um, Jeff was very kind about the container deposit um, piece. I was really proud to play a small part in helping the government see the merit of that proposal. But I also know that it was only on the back of the huge long-term multi-decade, frankly, effort um, that Total Environment Centre and many other partners had made uh, on the virtues of uh, a circular economy and connecting people directly with recycling and providing a, um, a real incentive to uh, remove containers from the environment and keep them in productive use. Um, it was only off the back of all of that effort that we were able to take that forward. Um, and it's a real thrill now to see every other state um, come, having already come on board or about to come on board. And now we're talking about how that um, wonderful program might expand and help support a more circular economy more broadly. 
Um, so thank you, Jeff, for the invitation to be here today and to everyone who's joined. I will try and get to all the questions too. Um, so really, I, I just wanted to touch on a couple of key issues. Um, I've been privileged to lead the Environment Protection Authority here in New South Wales for just on a year now. Um, and before I started, I, I read the legislation that establishes the EPA and um, it struck me that there are a number of things in that very forward thinking um, piece of drafting that the EPA has had in its toolkit but hasn't really used yet. Um, so I'll touch on some of that as well. Um, but maybe the, the first thing I'll say is um, the, the real focus for me now and over that last 12 months and then going forward is helping the EPA step into what we call internally a role of stewardship, which is actually quite um, analogous to the kind of custodianship that um, Aboriginal elders have practised since deep time. But it's, it's also about um, a few other elements. One is collaboration and humility um, uh, because we keep a focus on the outcome. The outcome is really at the heart of it um, because often it's not just an EPA issue, but any regulator gets hung up on the legal instruments and sometimes loses sight of the ultimate outcome that's trying to be achieved. Uh, and the, the third kind of element of what I call stewardship is really standing in the community's shoes to understand risk or harm from their point of view and make sure we're doing what's required to address that. Um, so that's really our approach. And if you look at our public documents, you can see some of that laid out in what we call our regulatory strategy and our regulatory policy. Um, because historically, I think the EPA has taken quite a legalistic approach to a lot of issues that sometimes has um, obscured the focus on the ultimate outcome. And through our regulatory policy and regulatory strategy, what we're signaling is we'll put the outcome at the centre and then we'll think about all those different tools uh, that we can use to get there. Now, some of those are traditional legal tools like prosecutions or enforcement action, but there are many others as well, influencing, uh, collaborating, listening, uh, educating, you know, monitoring. So we have really rigorous data to inform our decisions. All of that's critical. And some of these challenges are so complex, they're beyond the ability of the EPA directly to address. And we need to do that either jointly with the Commonwealth government or local councils or other stakeholders, like many of you, be that industry or community. Um, so th through putting the outcome at the centre and thinking holistically about all of those tools, I hope what you will see increasingly is an EPA that really focuses on the ultimate outcome and gets to the most effective, the most cost effective, the most efficient pathway to get there, uh, but to get to that outcome. Um, and so there are two other um, things I just want to call out from the legislation that are very much connected to that outcome focus. One is, if you read our act, it talks about the EPA being required to develop long-term environmental quality objectives. Um, now, historically, that's not something the EPA has put a lot of focus on, but I really think the time for that has come. Uh, it's amazing to me, for example, that nobody is telling Sydney Water or Hunter Water or other um, water and sewage operators, what do we want the ocean to be like in 2100 or in 2050? Uh, and how do we work back from there in the most efficient way to get to those outcomes? Similarly for air quality. Now we have a version of this with net zero with those targets. It's, it's wonderful to see legislation now progressing to enshrine some of those targets and also enshrine independent science-based advice um, on pathways for mitigation and, and advice on adaptation. But we haven't had that in other domains either. We obviously have a version of it in, in biodiversity and that seems to be evolving to nature positive um, as a, an outcome for individual pieces of development. But um, having a clear set of long-term environmental quality objectives uh, is really valuable for policy because uh, policymakers love to know the long-term goal. And I think we've, we've um, got an opportunity there to help really empower and turbocharge effective policy if we can be clear about what the long-term goals are. So that'll be something that we need to do collaboratively uh, across government and externally with all of you. And I'm looking forward to getting started on some of that um, next year. 
the other thing I wanted to point to is there's a tool in the Act called a Protection of the Environment Policy. Um, and we have been really pleased in the last six months or so, or a bit more actually, because I think we put it out just before the election, um, uh, through the Gazette, but to progress the very first one of those, um, which is for sustainable construction. And this is a tool that essentially binds every decision-making authority in government, including local government. Um, and what this tool aims to require in this case is for any infrastructure project that proponents lay out how they are minimising embodied carbon and maximising recycled content. Um, as part of their proposal. Um, so that, I think, will be uh, a really interesting journey for us to go on with industry, and we're consulting on this now and the community. But to get to a point where we implement that first PEP and then consider where else those tools are valuable, they can be used spatially, they can be used in particular domains of policy. Um, they're a really uh, interesting tool to achieve regulatory force for outcomes that uh, hasn't been explored previously. Um, so I'm very much looking forward to that. Um, now I might just touch on a couple of other key issues uh, and then I'm keen to get into the discussion and the questions. Um, before I started at the EPA, there was um, some litigation from a group called Bushfire Survivors for Climate Action. Um, and many of you will be across this detail, but for those of you who aren't, Essentially, that group was, was suggesting that um, under the Act, the EPA was required to develop policies and plans to address both the causes and consequences of environmental harm, certainly of major environmental harm. Um, and they were arguing that climate change is perhaps the most significant harm that we all face. And the court agreed with that view and made what's called a mandamus order on the EPA, which is a binding direction to essentially um, develop plans and, and policies to address the causes and consequences of the harm of climate change uh, for our community. Um, so that was really a watershed moment for the EPA um, and I think for the government because Jeff mentioned my previous role certainly without giving away um, too much, it's fair to say that I think the government's view previously had been, um, there, was, there wasn't a lot of enthusiasm for the EPA um, stepping into the regulatory space around climate. Um, but uh, we're required to. And so what we've done is um, develop a three-point action plan and a policy. And the, the three pillars of that are to inform and plan, to mitigate and adapt <clears throat> for climate change. And so we've, we've made um, some important steps there. We've um, put out a mandatory survey for the 3,000 largest carbon emitters or polluters, um, requiring them to share with us their own plans to get to net zero and or zero and, and also to adapt um, and improve their own resilience, subject to obviously what their, their asset footprint is. Um, and we're also um, close to finalising now some planning guidelines that will require proponents to set out very clearly how they um, are incorporating the 2050 net zero targets and any other targets into their proposal. And so that obviously then brings to the fore mitigation technologies in various sectors and so on, and ultimately license limits um, on emissions uh, for particular projects. So that I'm happy to talk more about climate as well if um, people have questions there. Um, the other one I just want to touch on is forestry. This is a um, actually, there are two other issues before we go to questions. One's forestry and then the other one is uh, plastic. And just quickly on forestry, um, this is obviously uh, a huge issue in terms of um, the damage that our forests have uh, suffered uh, since the Black Summer bushfires in 2019-20. Um, it's a critical issue to consider in terms of the climate risks and benefits of um, different settings and, and also obviously the biodiversity implications as well as the industry implications and timber supply and where we use timber, how do we use that in the most valuable um, ways and make sure that we've got a high value industry that's truly sustainable. Um, so 
there's a lot going on there at the moment um, around the Great Koala Park, um, and I can talk a little bit to that if, if people are interested. Um, but it's fair to say also that um, following that earlier court case I mentioned, we're, we're doing some work on what an EPA policy looks like um, in that space, and I'll be looking forward to sharing some of that soon as well. Um, we were pleased to enact some directions from our minister to prohibit harvesting in what's called koala hubs, which are these um, multi-data point regions of koala presence um, over multiple years inside the Great Koala National Park. And there's obviously a much broader process around um, establishment of that park and then what the settings are for the industry more broadly um, that you'd expect government to be undertaking. Um, and then finally, just on plastic, I wanted to say, um, again, a particular thank you to the Boomerang Alliance um, and Total Environment Centre and the leadership Jeff has provided with many of you um, for ongoing work there. Um, it's quite shocking really that um, almost 90% of the plastic we use and we're using more and more each year um, either goes to landfill or ends up as litter. And of course, every piece of plastic in the environment doesn't break down. It's not like glass or aluminium um, or wood where these things become inert and ultimately break down to their components. Uh, plastic just turns into microplastic and then gets reabsorbed into the food chain and ultimately um, ourselves. So this is a really important issue to make progress on under the plastic uh, and reduction and circular economy act that uh, the former government passed there was scheduled to be a review in 2024 uh, of the need for further regulatory action we have obviously progressed now to implement the phase out of um, eight or nine um, specific items like straws and and uh, disposable bags and so on single-use bags plates bowls stirrers cutlery and and so on um, but because of the seriousness of the issue, the government's actually chosen to bring forward this review. Um, and I'm hoping that very shortly we'll be able to release a, a green paper um, that opens up a consultation on a whole suite of items and alternatives and how we move to a more sustainable um, set of practices, whether that's around um, disposable items like uh, coffee cups or um, product design standards like uh, microplastic filters for washing machines. Um, so that the fibres from our clothes washing don't go into the ocean, um, <clears throat> as we're seeing in some other jurisdictions now too, or, or many other alternatives. And that's really going to be a very open uh, conversation where we really need um, input from all of you on what are the items that we need to focus on, particularly if there are some that you think aren't getting the focus they need, and what are the regulatory settings and opportunities there, both for new um, alternatives, new industries and resource recovery, uh, but also so we can fix the ultimate outcome, which is these single-use plastics are not winding up in the environment. Um, so maybe I'll end it there, and then perhaps we can we can go to some questions, Jeff, if that's all right. Yes, well, people have put up some very interesting questions over the last few weeks. I've amalgamated some of them, but um, we'll see how it goes. So the first question is how will New South Wales tighten environmental accountability and where does the EPA draw the line with what is an acceptable level of environmental harm based on the best available scientific evidence and the precautionary principle? It's a great question. Um, I think I'd probably start with what I mentioned around articulating long-term environmental quality objectives. Um, because it's very hard to take a risk-based approach if you're not clear on what the end is. Uh, I mean, it's a real question for me, do we actually want to be a city in, in by the year 2100 that still pumps 5 million people's sewage out into the ocean without treating it? Uh, I think um, setting those long-term environmental quality objectives for, the, for our, air, our air quality, our waterways, um, our um, oceans, our soil and for biodiversity is a critical starting point. So you'll see much more activity there and engagement. Um, but at, you know, at the project level, we really try to take a risk-based approach that poses, that protects human health and the environment. Now that doesn't always mean zero uh, pollution, but it means um, if there are emissions, they have to ultimately be safe. Uh, and we use licensing, we use um, regulations that 
Parliament makes and other tools uh, to help us encouraging compliance and good practice and where um, operators are recalcitrant, then we can require it. Yes. <clears throat> Uh, the second question I think you've started to touch on is about planning policies to foster cooler, greener suburban environments, especially with the challenge of urban sprawl, uh, housing design and availability and biodiversity protection. I've got to say, the EPA entering the urban planning development field is unique. It will be most interesting. So you could share some of your early thoughts on that. Um, well, yeah, look, I'm, I'm conscious any intervention by the EPA has to improve the outcome, not just add complexity. So I think there are a lot of things here that we'd like to see that can most easily be done through planning instruments. And we are working now with our colleagues in planning and the planning minister and, and his team and our minister are working very closely on all of these issues. Um, they're obviously big issues and we can expect them to continue to worsen um, at least for most of our lives uh, while emissions stabilise and, and ultimately decline. But um, I think there are, there are interesting questions for the EPA here. Um, do we think about indoor air quality in ways we haven't previously? Um, do we think about um, disclosure and ultimately reduction of the embodied carbon in building materials and making that easy and simple for people to understand and also recycled content. Um, I think there's a lot of opportunity when we think about the climate policy and the targets we have to actually focus on scope three emissions. Uh, and that means um, starting with good data and disclosure. So when you go to buy a product, it's clear how much, what, what is the embodied carbon? And that's, you know, a, a consistent methodology that um, is agreed. Uh, and then over time, how do we require that embodied carbon to reduce? Um, and that, so that's maybe a precursor to the ultimate um, carbon footprint of the building, but I think it's very important. Uh, so this is an additional question. We, we had a briefing on the Net Zero Commission bill uh, a couple of weeks ago. While the EPA, uh, while the Net Zero Commission can develop advice on its own initiative, the actual implementation of the advice depends on EPA powers. So I'm wondering uh, how far you've developed that interaction between the Net Zero Commission and the EPA. Um, well, we don't, so we don't have the commission yet. We have the net zero board and we're working closely with them. And I suspect some of them will probably transition into the commission. Um, but very much, I'm, I'm hoping it'll be a very positive development, having an independent commission there um, to provide advice, to, to make um, statements about what's required that can then support effective science-based regulation that the EPA takes forward. I think it'll be... A, a very symbiotic relationship and we can also inform the commission about our understanding and knowledge from various regulated industries about where the low hanging fruit is where the harder challenges are so we we don't have to reinvent the wheel i'm, I'm hoping that all of the work we've done in the last 18 months will really make sure they get off to a flying start right on the forests <clears throat> uh you've mentioned the great koala national park uh, but I'm sure you're aware there are some issues with koala habitats, especially in the peri-urban areas such as southwest Sydney. Uh, does the EPA have a role here? Look, we don't have a direct role, uh, but we do obviously provide advice to our colleagues in planning. Ultimately, I think the planning, is it the Cumberland Plain um, planning instruments, uh, what, what will drive those sort of more local protections. Um, so I guess our, our view is always that environmental and social issues should be considered right up front in the planning process. And we're getting a lot of traction with our colleagues in planning on um, opportunities to just improve the architecture over time. Um, I don't have a specific um, role or I guess additional um, point on Southwest Sydney and development with koalas though. No, it's okay. 
Right, broader forestry breaches. Given the community's documentation of breaches in public native forestry operations, how does the EPA plan to improve regulation and monitoring, monitoring of logging activities for a range of threatened species uh, and hollows for threatened species that forestry are not protecting in their failing self-regulating capacity? Um, look, there's a lot in that question. Um, they're not, it's important to note they're not self-regulating. There are different rules that the agricultural minister sort of oversees for plantations, but for any what we call crown forestry, which is native forests and harvesting there, um, the rules are governed by the integrated forestry operations approval, um, which is made jointly by the agricultural minister and the, the environment minister. Um, <clears throat> the EPA does have uh, a major role there as the regulator, and we've taken action recently on a number of projects either um, requesting Forest Corp to stop uh, while we work through issues, which they've they've done, or directing them to stop. And we issued a mandatory stop work order in Talaganda State Forest on the south coast, um, which I think um, might be uh, what prompted the, the mention of um, glider dens uh, in that question. Uh, and that really goes to concerns around the competence of the corporation um, to conduct surveys and protect threatened species when they're proposing to harvest an area. So um, there's several matters there that are under investigation. And uh, I probably can't talk much about that except to say we've commissioned our own surveys and identified you know, quite significant numbers of threatened species and den trees and so on. And in our mind, a process to require that identification is at the very basis of anything that could be considered competent. So um, what's this space, I guess I would say. So do you think native forest logging is compatible with biodiversity and climate protection? Um, I've thought, of, I mean, I'm, I'm thinking a lot about this and I'd be interested in views from anyone you know, any of the organisations here or now or later, I think it's an important question. Um, if we are not happy with the current regime, what might a high quality, sustainable regime look like? And, you know, you can talk to plantations and how they fit in um, as well. But I think there are many different varieties of civiculture. And, I mean, for example, is it possible that you could have Forest Stewardship Council certification for some sort of native forestry? Um, I suspect there would be some way to do that, but I don't know. Um, I think what I, what I do think um, very much in terms of um, the EPA's view and the government's view is there's a lot of values there that need to be protected and the carbon value as well is one that perhaps hasn't been considered um, comprehensively in the past and needs to be, but the, the settings um, certainly... Uh, you know, independent analysis has shown that some of those settings do need to be updated. So just conscious that I, as a public servant, I wear a hat where I, I can comment on EPA policy. I can't perhaps comment so much on other policy, but I'd just say I think that there are a number of reviews there and public information that the government's committed to considering as it um, maps out a future for a, a timber industry that's that's value adding and, and obviously protects um, high quality jobs, but also does the right thing by the natural resources that we're so lucky to have here. Well, moving on to plastic pollution, which you do have a direct connection to, how does the EPA plan to address the continued use of plastic bags, of whatever thickness, and the packaging of products in plastic that aren't currently recycled? And what are your plans for future collection and recycling, uh, particularly in the context of the Commonwealth's interest in regulation? Um, yeah, look, this is this is obviously a big question. I mean, many people on this call would have been disappointed, to say the least, when Red Cycle collapsed and all of the soft plastic we had been recycling through the supermarkets <clears throat> halted. Uh, there are... A number of things there. One is we've been engaging with the supermarkets since that time. Under our law, if you contribute to pollution 
you can be liable for it. So we've been able to have really good engagement with the supermarkets around them starting to apply the same rigor to the downstream part of their supply chain that they they put upstream in terms of animal welfare or human slavery and other things. So um, I think the view that oh there's a contract with Red Cycle and we signed it and it's Red Cycle's problem not ours doesn't really carry much water. And the supermarkets have been quite positive actually in um, acting now to deal with all those stockpiles to get the maximum possible material recycled. <clears throat> and then they've, with the Food and Grocery Council, I think they've worked on their own alternative plan for packaging to come back, which um, I'm always, um, I, I think it's useful to, to remain sceptical about voluntary stewardship schemes, but I think if they are more universal, um, then they, they do provide ultimately the most effective solution. Um, now, the Commonwealth is working on a number of potential alternatives here. Um, on the collection side, I know a number of councils have started um, small scale collecting of this material again because there's a public demand for it. Uh, we just need to make sure we're not contaminating our recycling facilities more broadly by mixing it all into the yellow bin because um, it's quite shocking when you go to one of these plants and see the quantity that um, of contamination and uh, much of what we put in the yellow bin ends up contaminating the recycling content so much that it has to go into landfill. So uh, from the EPA's point of view, uh, and this has been our point of view with the Commonwealth as well, and we're, we're working together with them on, on what the national scheme might um, look like, is you, ha you have to be very clear about the value of source separation and creating those um, uncontaminated streams of product if you're going to have real recycling. Yes, I should send you my notes from the National Plast Soft Plastic Summit I went to about a month ago, and they do seem to be on the right track, and they have done actual trials of curbside collection of soft plastics in special coloured bags. And as long as those bags are picked out uh, before they get to the more complicated sorting processes at MRFs, there's absolutely no worry about contamination. That yeah, no, oh, that's great. Yeah, I'd love to see those notes, Jeff. It'd be good to talk some more about that. Another question, and we will get to some of the Q&As because uh, we're almost finished with the pre pre ready ones. How does the EPA plan to regulate microplastics at the street level especially considering they're not classified as litter? Um, they're not litter, but they are pollution. So, uh, I mean, there are a number of bans that have, have been in effect since November last year around microplastic in personal care products like toothpaste and shampoo and body wash and so on. Um, <clears throat> so we, one thing is... We, you know, there's, that's made under a regulation, so we'll continue to look and consider any suggestions about what else might fall under that design standard. So essentially those products are prohibited from sale now in New South Wales unless they can show they don't contain those things, uh, microplastics. And we're also working quite closely with the manufacturers on nurdles and um, their own processes. So I think there's some government grants around in, to help improve the manufacturing systems there and um, we're also giving guidance to councils on how to manage nurdles through something called Operation Clean Sweep and we're partnering with Tangaroa Blue uh, who are helping us work with industry and councils on education advice and a whole lot of other control measures. Uh, now that the European Commission has banned synthetic turf fields, what are the New South Wales EPA's views on future legis legislation around installations of new synthetic turf fields and maintaining the current ones? Um, look, this is a live question. Obviously, the chief scientist was commissioned a few years ago to do some work on this, and the government's now released that report, and uh, planning. my colleagues in planning are leading the whole of government response. Suffice to say... The EPA will be very focused there on how you um, re reduce and uh, remove the um, proliferation of microplastic and, and other contaminants that can flow from these facilities. Um, I know there's a lot of interest from local government. I'm not sure if there's any local government uh, colleagues on, on this call, but um, 
the I think the issue is you know some locations um, councils feel these facilities are much more appropriate because of the the inundation or other things that make grass more challenging but we do need to manage any impact into the environment and the chief scientist review I think gives us some some really good data and some pretty stark evidence that those settings do need to change mm. so we'll see the government will respond um, yes uh, TEC certainly been writing to them with our OSMAP surveys so final question and then we'll get on to the Q&A how does the New South Wales EPA view the practice of converting waste to energy, especially in terms of its sustainability and environmental implications? Um, well, look, again, some of this is government policy that um, I'll, I'll speak factually about. I think New South Wales has the some of the strictest, in fact, I think the strictest guidelines for these facilities um, globally, and that's quite a conscious position. Um, I think for the residual material that cannot be recycled or recovered, there may be a role for these facilities in helping us um, uh, deal with that material. Um, but ideally we wanna work uh, to maximize the recovery of resources um, that <clears throat> would otherwise go to landfill or to, to these facilities. So um, I think the the energy from waste strategy of the government recognises that when you, um, if you can recover energy from waste, then this can be legitimate and necessary for residual waste management. Um, and it's important to see that in the context of the alternative, such as going to landfill. Um, and I think uh, we are reviewing now the waste levy settings as a five yearly review starting now. Um, and I, I'm sure some of these issues will feed into that as well. Okay, well, if you can have a look at the Q&A, you'll oh. see some questions you can answer live. <laughs> um, okay, so the first question I can see is from Finn at Kelpie um, about seaweed polymers and plastic replacement. So, um, Finn, I'm really happy to talk about this directly. Uh, Finn's saying that the single-use plastic ban prevents um, Kelpie from commercialising a 100% biocompostable solution. So um, we're very conscious of the need for the settings to evolve as technology evolves. And um, I'm sure uh, you might have seen, um, we engaged Dr. Kathy Wilkinson, who's the former head of the Victorian EPA to do a review of our resource recovery orders and exemptions and our settings around um, innovation and recycling. <coughs> and out of that, there'll be a series of um, sandbox regimes that we roll out to allow new innovative products um, to progress. Uh, so I'm happy to talk about that in more detail. I guess the question for us will be not just PFAS, which is in very a great many um, products that currently meet the compostability standard, but the standard itself, and we're engaging with Standards Australia on this, it was written 25 years ago, and it doesn't take account of a number of concerning chemicals that are often found in various um, materials that meet the compostability standard and then they end up in um, our soils and, and uh, compost. So we want to make sure um, as we seek to get the food scraps and garden waste out of people's red bins and in back into circulation and keeping those nutrients circulating the way they always have through nature, that we have a high quality compost product at the end. Um, and that's really one of the one of the guide guiding principles for the household settings. Uh, the next two questions from uh, Sutherland Environment Centre, Catherine, uh, and they're complimenting the EPA on taking action against uh, Peabody but they'd like to know what more can be done to protect the park on an ongoing basis. Um, well, look, we did we did a review of the Peabody licence, um, which we brought forward. We re review licences every five years, but we brought that one forward. We put a whole lot of new conditions in there about real-time monitoring and maintaining um, the containment for water discharges. So I think we can get to a point where 
there are no discharges from that mine. There is still, as um, the question says, and there's some legacy um, coal um, finds and so on in the Hacking River. Unfortunately, uh, some of that goes back a very long way. And so I think, you know, we have, I'm very happy for us to work with national parks on how we do um, help to remediate that over time. But the advice to me at least is that a lot of, a lot of that um, contamination does go back, you know, to the long history of mining there at that site. And so um, we'd, we'd want to just make sure that we've got the right ecological advice so that we're, we're not creating negative impacts um, in any cleanup. And that's something we pushed Peabody very hard on with, um, <clears throat> with the cleanup in the recent, from the recent discharges. Uh, a question from Simone about what use are the grants that the EPA provides? Um, well, look, the grants are really there to help um, projects that may not yet be commercial get to that next stage or um, achieve additional infrastructure so that we have the infrastructure in place um, for the new recycling requirements. And they're one tool we use. They're not the only tool, but um, we do have a number under our carbon abatement program. <clears throat> Obviously, there are FOGO grants, BIN trim, which is a series of grants for small businesses that struggle often to optimise their recycling. Um, so I think they can play a really useful role. Right, back on to microplastics. Uh, sorry, what's the microplastics one, Jeff? Michelle Osman. Uh, are they are there plans for microplastics to be included in water quality testing and what threshold? Um, yes, I think we should include that. I don't have off the top of my head what the appropriate threshold is, um, but we're doing a, a big push this year on improving our monitoring of water and air quality in various parts of the state. So, Michelle, I'm really happy to get a note from you or perhaps catch up later and talk about what your view is on the, the relevant thresholds. Um, and then I can see another question about soft plastics. It's not allowed to be burned as an alternative fuel. So I suspect soft plastic is going to landfill if it's not being recycled. Uh, does the EPA have a position about uh, UNEA3 Inc? Sorry, I'm not sure what, what is UNEA3. I do know, but it's escaped me. Maybe a theorem could just give us a bit of extra info. Ah, the issue of offsets. How do you feel about offsets from Dame Claire? Uh, how do I feel? Um, I don't know that we've yet formed a definitive view on offsets. We do have some regulatory responsibilities around um, new electricity infrastructure, which is required to be net zero by 2035. Um, now the net, there's obviously two ways to be net zero. One is to just be actually zero, or the other is to use some form of compensating activity or offset. So we're working through that now. I don't have a particular view, but I do think um, one of the ways, one of the new lenses to think about um, commercial forests, for example, is what are the values, what are the carbon values in, in um, protecting them for that purpose, for example. Uh, Karen's asked a question about why they didn't start planting hardwood plantations on private land. I've got to tell you, Karen, they did, and they also planted softwood plantations, but they still like logging native forests. <laughs> there you go. Good. Answer. That's Jeff's answer. <laughs> yeah, here's one close to my heart. What is your opinion on expanding CDS beyond beverages into other consumer products or packaging? Um, look, I think product stewardship more broadly, whether it's CDS or some other scheme, is a really effective way to link the responsibility of the producer who's manufacturing these packaging materials or other things um, with the environmental impact of that material and closing that loop. 
So, I mean, the EPA is very supportive of product stewardship generally. Um, and as I mentioned, we're maybe um, less readily convinced about various voluntary schemes, although sometimes they do seem to address the issue adequately, but a universal scheme that everyone's part of and nobody can free ride on is, is really what we would consider good practice. Um, and so for CDS, I think there are some interesting questions there around what are the other um, containers that might be included. Um, and so that's something that we're very open to taking forward and looking at uh, collaboratively. We've obviously got a whole lot of consultation from the um, initial proposal that was put out uh, last year around um, various other alcoholic beverage containers um, and some other options such as milk, for example, which is not, not included. And I think um, government generally considers that more of a staple and uh, obviously it's used at home. So we're really talking about circular economy benefits rather than litter reduction. But if you go down that road, then um, there are some other interesting questions like all the other glass um, and plastic material uh, that we, we buy our food in. So yeah, we're, we're, we're very engaged on that. Okay, questions from Virginia Young. You'll see there. Oh yes, on biodiversity and the, the CBD. Um, look, we are, I mean, obviously any, any agreement that Australia um, is party to, um, we think about how do we draw that down into our various um, legislative and regulatory architecture. Um, the EPA typically is not a regulator on biodiversity, except in the context of forestry. Um, but I think the, the short answer is Yes, I think the government as a whole um, is engaging on the um, 30 by 30 agenda and nature positive <laughs> agenda and what does that look like? And it's very much a focus, I think, of this government. Uh, another question on bioplastics from seaweed. Uh, uh, look, I think I've answered that in the main. I think the, the point really is Bioplastics can be a very useful um, tool to help reduce the impact of plastic in the environment. But we also, there's a whole lot to consider when you think about plastic. And part of that is behavior change and moving to more reusable alternatives that don't need um, single use manufacturing. So um, I'm very happy to engage with Kelpie or others on um, bioplastics, but we also just need to bear in mind, and we also need to bear in mind if we're moving away from single-use plastic, part of that is about how we reuse and re, re um, you know, just adjust our own practices that have evolved in recent decades with the proliferation of single-use plastic. And Karen, I knew she was going to ask this. When will New South Wales ban the release of balloons? Um, well, we're expecting to release a discussion paper very soon that touches on these issues, and I look forward to your... Um, feedback on that. Uh, I know a number of jurisdictions have banned the release of balloons, and that's certainly something that we're looking forward to engaging on. Um, what's this Upper Hunter Air Quality Monitoring Network? Um, how do we manage dust? Well, we have a program um, that we've just started called Bust the Dust, where we really focus mining operators' attention on dust and the need to mitigate it. And it's particularly obviously relevant now as we move into drier conditions with um, the um, change from El Nino to La Nina. Um, so unless I've got that the wrong way around, <clears throat> but the, the cycle we're moving into is more hot, dry uh, summer. So that is a real, it's a real focus. Um, the monitoring network is one useful tool and we're actually looking at how we develop monitoring networks in other parts of the state to give communities access to that data and understand the quality of the air that they're breathing. But we'll focus very much on um, mit mitigating and minimizing dust leaving mining sites. And there are license conditions that we can enforce where we need to, in fact, a number of the prosecutions we currently have before the court involving the um, 
Newcrest, I think it's now Newmont, um, owned mine at Cadia involved that issue. Uh, Liz O'Brien has a question about uh, the new Bowdoin's lead mine and whether the EPA can overturn the um, planning panel approval. I'm not sure. Um, <clears throat> look, under the law, at, as it stands, the EPA gives advice to our colleagues in planning or to the independent planning um, commission panel who then make a decision and other agencies give advice too. So we, we're one agency that gives advice um, and we don't make the ultimate decision. Yeah. We then have to replicate the conditions of consent in our license. And these issues are now, um, I think, being considered by the parliamentary inquiry into mining. Scott Wilson, the role of science, very important question. Um, look, I think it is critical, not only science, but also the ability to communicate that science and particularly environmental health and where <clears throat> sort of human health and environmental um, pollution crossover. I think through a variety of um, bureaucratic changes and machinery of government changes, you know, over, over the last decade, that's not something the EPA, EPA has now, but we do work very closely with our colleagues in the other agencies where that expertise sits. Um, but personally, I, you know, I think it's critical expertise that we need to harness for the benefit of the community. Uh, important question from Chris. <laughs> Maybe not feeling well enough to think of the future, Tony, but I'm sure. Oh, legacies. Uh, <laughs> if, I, if I could help um, the EPA get to the point where it, it and government are endorsing and articulating long-term environmental quality objectives across the different domains. I think that would be a real, a, a real positive. Um, I mean, for all of us, I think the legacy is the same. We want a sustainable, prosperous, thriving future where, you know, we have a zero carbon, very circular economy and biodiversity is protected and, um, we've got a great society. So obviously that's not, the EPA can't do that alone. We can only all do it together. And, and we're just one part of the tools government will use to hopefully achieve that future. But that that's really what motivates me. Okay. <clears throat> Julie Taylor Mills is thanking the EPA for taking action on Talaganda. Looking forward to greater teeth and more robust and prompt allocate application of EPA powers. Uh, oh, and Aaron's clarified it's the United Nations Environment Assembly Intergovernmental Negotiation Committee. Um, I've got to say, Aaron, I'm not familiar with that committee. Um, I mean, in intergenerational equity is something that um, is in our act and we're very mindful of we've set up a youth advisory council to try and put some of that lens on our work but um, I'm, I'm really happy to engage on that well I think we've got through all of them well <clears throat> I'm sure on behalf of all of us we want to thank you very much for your vision for the environment and the EPA uh, I'm sure you're already aware of the multitude of issues <laughs> that confront the environment. Uh, and uh, uh, I'm sure we're all looking forward to seeing greater vigilance and proactive uh, efforts by the EPA to protect the environment. So thanks, everybody, for participating. And we'll let uh, Tony get a bed and recover. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks, everyone. I'm really happy to do this again soon as well. Uh, but do reach out to me on it, on those issues if you'd like to. And thank you for everything all of you do as important stakeholders for the EPA and, you know, for the community. Bye.